Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lynn Warner, Dean of the School of Social Welfare at the University at Albany, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2022 Catherine Breyer Lawson Lecture. This lecture series was established to honor Dr. Breyer Lawson when she stepped down from her most distinguished service as Dean of the School of Social Welfare from 1999 through 2015. The purpose of the series is to educate the campus and surrounding communities on a broad range of topics related to the research and practice of social work. A defining feature of this lecture series, and indeed a hallmark of Dr. Brian Lawson's career, is forging partnerships between social workers and others who are committed to finding solutions to societal ills that prevent individuals and communities of color from living lives that are as valued, celebrated, and protected as those of whites. It is critically important to continue to have conversations across academic disciplines and with community partners that acknowledge racism's impacts and that generate insights about addressing them. We are thrilled to host this year's speaker, Professor Loretta Ross, award-winning, nationally renowned expert on racism and racial justice, women's rights, reproductive justice, and human rights. As you know, an event like this is only possible because of the dedication and care of many people. I offer a special mention of thanks to Stewart's Shops for their support of this year's lecture. Additionally, we are indebted to the individuals who joined the Friends of Catherine Breyer Lawson Honorary Committee. Finally, I would like to thank each of you for attending. And I invite you to enter any questions during the talk via the Q&A function on your screen. I'll moderate the roughly 30 minute Q&A session with Professor Ross at the end of her lecture. Now it is my great honor to introduce Loretta Ross, a women's rights and human rights leader whose activism, teaching and theory development emphasize the intersectionality of social justice issues and how intersectionality can fuel transformation. She's co-written three books on reproductive justice, Undivided Rights, Women of Color Organized for Reproductive Justice, Reproductive Justice and Introduction, and Radical Reproductive Justice, Foundations, Theory and Practice Critique. Loretta was a co-founder and the national coordinator from 2005 to 2012 of the Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. Other leadership positions have included national co-director of the 2004 March for Women's Lives in Washington, DC, founder and executive director of the National Center for Human Rights Education, program research director at the Center for Democratic Renewal, the National Anti-Klan Network, and founder of the Women of Color program for now, the National Organization for Women. Professor Loretta Ross is a sought after speaker and regularly appears in major media outlets such as CNN, Good Morning America, The Donahue Show, and The Charlie Rose Show. She is a thought leader who has been featured in the New York Times, Time Magazine, The Los Angeles Times, The Washington Post, among others. She has received numerous awards, including the National Center for Human Rights Education, the first Mother of Human Rights Education Award, the International Black Women's Congress, ONI Award, the National Women's Health Network Barbara Seaman Award for Activism in Women's Health. And in 2020, she was named by Ms. Magazine to the list of top 100 feminists. She's a graduate of Agnes Scott College and holds honorary doctorates from Arcadia University and Smith College, where she is currently a visiting associate professor teaching courses on white supremacy, human rights, and calling in the calling out culture. We're so delighted to welcome Professor Ross here today. And now, Professor Ross, the Zoom stage is yours. Well, thank you for that fabulous introduction. I hope that y'all discern from my introduction that I spent the better part of 50 years as a human rights and social justice activist. I called myself a professional feminist. And then five years ago, I started teaching 
what I'd learned in the community in academic settings. So they called me a clinical professor. And so it's my joy to teach about human rights, women's rights, white supremacy, and calling in the calling out culture within the academy, trying to put some uh, practice to the theory that people are learning. I find that within the academy that we're teaching quite radical knowledge, quite radical information to young people and often not so young people, but we're teaching this radical information and knowledge without the accompanying radical practices of love, grace, and forgiveness that go along with it. So we end up being hypercritical of each other because that's the academic discipline which we're taught. And we don't know how to turn that off when it comes to doing coalitional work, it, it, when it comes to making change in the institutions that practice their institutionalized racism, homophobia, misogyny and stuff. And it doesn't really work well in life when you go around being the know-it-all obnoxious <laughs> educated elite when you really need to figure out how to converse in quite human terms with people without being so hypercritical of everything that other people say so that you can actually learn to grow. So having said all of that, let me get to my presentation. I do have a PowerPoint that helps me organize my thoughts and keep it better organized. Uh, my question is, can you see that? And let me make sure I put it in presentation mode. Ask yep, that we question. can yes. see you're all set. All right, thank you. I do this work because I believe in human rights. I did not have a clear articulation of what I was fighting for for a long time. I was so clear that I was fighting against racism, fighting against homophobia, fighting against sexism, fighting against economic injustice, on and on. But it wasn't until I had a chance to reread Dr. King's March 31st, 1968 final sermon, Sunday sermon before he was assassinated that I realized that Dr. King not only had a dream, he had a plan. He called upon us to build a US-based human rights movement as a way of fighting for all for the world that we want to build so that we're not only defined by what we're against, but we have a vision of what we're fighting for. So obviously because I'm a feminist, I believe in women's rights and I'm part of the women's rights wing of the human rights movement. But I also believe in racial justice. So I'm part of the civil rights wing of the human rights movement. But I'm disabled as well. So I believe in disability rights. Obviously, I don't have enough space to put all the arrows on the page for all the things that we who are in the human rights movement can, are concerned about. But I'm using this graphic to help us understand that we're all in the same movement, even as we focus on different things. And what that ultimately means is that I can't fight for women's rights in a way that is racist without violating the same human rights framework that I'm fighting for. I can't fight for civil rights in a homophobic way, or I can't fight for trans rights in a misogynistic way without undermining the very human rights movement that I am a part of. And so I'm saying that to say that how we do the work for human rights is as important as the work that we do, what we focus on. And that's why I think the calling in practices are so important because I believe that calling in practices will be as important to the human rights movement as nonviolence was to the civil rights movement in the 20th century, a way to define how we do the work and the values that we stand for. So with that in mind, I created something called a C5 continuum, comprised of calling out, canceling, calling in, calling on, and calling it off. Now, we all understand what calling out is. 
that's publicly shaming people for something we think that they've done wrong and we want to hold them accountable for it. But when we use the tactic of public shaming and blaming, we often are thwarted because we don't get what we want. We don't achieve our goal of holding people accountable. We actually just replicate the same prison industrial complex that dominates our society. Now, canceling is the ultimate call out. When you want someone to suffer severe repercussions for something you think, think, think that they've done wrong for which you think they should be held accountable. Calling in exists on the continuum where you want people to be held accountable for the harm that they do, but instead of calling them out and using blaming and shaming as your tactic, you're going to use love, respect as your tactic. And I'll be talking more about that. Calling on is an intermediate step that I'll also be talking about in the next slide. That's where you're not investing your time or attention into someone else's growth, which you would do with both calling out and calling in. Calling on is the request that people do better without your taking the time to make sure that they do so. And of course, there's calling it off. And I don't think we use that enough, whether in real life or online. We have no obligation to participate in unproductive conversations. Uh, we can call it off temporarily by saying something like, I don't have the bandwidth to deal with this right now. Or we can call it off permanently by saying, I will never want to have this conversation with you again. And so that's the five C's and that's what we're going to be exploring today. Now, I wanna stop and look at calling on in more detail. Sonia Renee Taylor, who wrote the book, The Body is Not an Apology, created the concept of calling on because she was dissatisfied with the fact that calling in requires an investment of labor, whether it's emotional, energetic, or political in someone else's growth. And so she created the concept of calling on because she wants people to play, you know, take responsibility for their own growth. And this way you center on the person's behavior that needs to change, but instead of participating in that process or assigning response or accepting responsibility for that process, you're assigning responsibility to the person who needs to do the work. So my favorite calling on sentence, for example, is to look the person dead in the eye and say, I beg your pardon. And then I just wait. Quite often in that pregnant silence, people realize that they've said something that they may need to rethink or walk back. And in that process, I have neither called on them, I mean, called, called them out or called them in. I've called on them to do better. So don't forget that you can use that skeptical eye to help people rethink what they just put out there in the universe. So let's talk about calling out some more. I find that calling out is criticizing other people's social justice practices, but generally the people who do that are not at all critical of their own. They, they seem to lack a capacity for self-reflection and self-evaluation because they make the assumption that they know how to do it right and anybody doesn't agree with them must be doing it wrong. It's also born of the, feeling, of the feelings that people have when they feel unheard, when they feel disrespected, or when they feel that they're violated. They often resort to the calling out tactic as a way to address these feelings. There's also virtue signaling, where people are publicly using knowledge as a weapon against each other. I find it quite humorous that people will try to weaponize a concept that they just recently learned and use it to lord over other people who don't know what they know, as if they don't understand that knowledge is the heaviest privilege in the world that you need to use responsibly. And then people seem to think that they're in a woke competition and they need to banish others because they're not woke enough. But I'll say as a seasoned activist, 
to the extent that you think you're in a woke competition, all that proves is that you're not woke enough because we're not in the oppression Olympics. We are not in a woke competition. If you think you're competing with others about power and status within the human rights movement, you're doing it all wrong. I find that some people do though want to use social activism to boost one's ego and their standing in community. And another thing I didn't put on this slide is that the human rights movement is an emotional magnet for people who, ex who have experienced trauma. And so they come to the movement thinking that this is where they're going to obtain their healing from their trauma. But the purpose of the human rights movement is to end oppression not to serve as people's personal therapy spaces. And so sometimes people use calling out as a way to put out over a keyboard some things they should take to a therapist. Particularly, there are people who are falsely believing that the best way to achieve human rights victories is by political purity of opinions. That, there's, that we have to have the most radical analysis, that we all have to think the same way. And then they shame and bully people who don't agree with them. But they don't understand that the purpose of the human rights movement and our tactics need to be to persuade people to agree to be with us, to join us in the struggle, even if they don't totally agree with us about the nature of the struggle or what we focus on or how we should do the work. Because there are so many ways to fight oppression, just like there's many, sometimes many pathways up to a mountaintop. And there's no saying that one pathway is better than the other or one set of strategies is better than the other. I think it's gonna take all of our ideas, all of our identities and all of our generations to end this matrix called oppression. Now there's a podcaster who's very popular and very smart called Natalie Wynn. And her podcast is called ContraPoints. And she's done an analysis of how quickly the calling out cancel culture gets magnified. And it starts with the presumption of guilt instead of a presumption of innocence. For example, let's say that you're in a meeting and somebody says something that is sexist, racist, homophobic, transphobic, or whatever, it doesn't even matter. But if they say something that someone thinks can be one of those things, if someone calls them out for their racism, their sexism, homophobia, transphobia, or whatever, immediately there's a presumption of guilt instead of and a presumption of innocence as there would be in a legal situation, in a law setting, in a courtroom. And that presumption of guilt is built on the fact that the person who's doing the call out is seen as the authority on whatever that issue is, and that that is the defining no questions asked declaration of reality. And this presumption of guilt is arrived at so quickly that there's no interrogating what took place, whether or not the comment that the person is accused of actually was sexist, actually was racist, actually was homophobic. And there's no accounting for differences of opinions and differences of subjectivity. Again, it's a presumption of guilt that gets so quickly abstracted uh, that it then becomes essentialized. It becomes attached to that person's moral character. So it quickly goes from Joe said something was racist to Joe is a racist, a condemnation of who Joe is and who Joe represents, usually behind some identity determinism, some basic things about Joe must be this because he said that kind of thing. And this is usually done by people who assume a pseudo moralistic or a pseudo intellectual high ground. I know what sexism is. I know what misogyny is. I know what racism is kind of approach, not allowing any debate, any questioning or anything 
And as a matter of fact, the whole attempt to question, to have dialogue with them is seen as a moral failing by the people attempting to have a conversation. And this is based upon a dualistic false binary system of right, wrong, good, bad, you know, good, evil, that a lot of people very uh, simplistically apply to humans and human interactions where we want, you know, we, we want things to be overly simplified so that they can be more easily digested by us. And then this also carries with it an aspect of unforgivability and unforgettability. Simply because Joe has been accused of this behavior of racism, sexism, whatever, then he will never ever be forgiven for it because Joe is caught in a classic catch-22. If he attempts to apologize for what he said, then he's going to be read as gaming the system, trying to get over. But if he says, well, I didn't do anything wrong, I just made a remark or made a statement, then if he refuses to apologize, he's going to be read as trying to evade accountability. So he's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. And then that will be unforgettable. It will be permanently attached to Joe's character, to Joe's uh, just anybody thinking about Joe, describing Joe, or seeking to work with Joe will have this come up again because there's a contamination infection aspect to it. So anybody coming to the defense of poor Joe will seen as catching Joe's political cooties of racism, transphobia, homophobia, whatever, and have, will be seen as being infected by Joe. And then all of this happens in seconds from the denunciation to the uh, ostracism can happen in seconds. So the symptoms of calling out generally happen because people size up who they want to call out because they don't want to call out people that they think that will necessarily come back and threaten them. So we have a tendency to call out people who can't come back at us, who can't access us who can't uh, punish us for what we're doing. And of course, there are other symptoms where people seek approval from others just when they're showing off how woke they are. I also see a lot of calling outs happen as deflections when they don't wanna deal with the primary issues and, and wanna seize on other topics. For example, anytime I'm doing a lecture on white supremacy, for example, there's almost inevitably someone in the audience, if it's a predominantly white audience, who wants to deflect to another issue of transphobia or economic injustice or I grew up poor or whatever they want to deflect to. And there are people who are perpetually looking for a fight despite, despite the fact that the way that they interact with others always generates conflicts and silences others yet they are persuaded that that's the best way for them to do the work. We also, because we're in this neoliberal liberal competitive society, we have this win at all costs kind of mentality going on within our society. So people, instead of de-escalating the conflict, they like to escalate it as a way to seek the win, even if it ends up totally dehumanizing people who don't agree with you, as if people with differences of opinion somehow become subhuman to you. I also find that within a lot of university settings that people complain about the failure to be protected quite often. Uh, and so they're more angry at the person who failed to protect them than the person from whom they need to be protected from. I saw this when swastikas, for example, were painted on our university buildings at Smith College and the president issued a letter of apology, basically saying, this isn't Smith, I'm so sorry this happened, blah, 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 the usual tepid letter that a university president would write. But the students got angrier at the president because they didn't like the tone of her letter more than they were at the person who had painted swastikas on the building. 
which by the way, had to be somebody interior to the campus of Smith because some of the swastikas were painted on in places where you needed a Smith key card to access. So instead of interrogating who within the Smith community had that access and painted the swastikas, they decided to organize against the president for not being, quote, I guess, protective enough of them. And this is born out of the mismatch of expectations uh, versus reality, where they actually thought that being enrolled in a high privileged campus like Smith means that they would be protected and safe from incidences of racism and white supremacy and anti-Semitism, homophobia, et cetera, when in fact, Smith is part of the world. So calling out becomes very toxic because it replicates the carceral system of punishment. It discourages others from wanting to join the movement because who in the world wants to join a movement of Debbie Downers who make you feel worse about yourself than before you came. It can also frighten people into not speaking up to truth, speaking up to tell their truth for fear that that target is going to be painted on their foreheads next. And then of course, in such a toxic atmosphere, it drives people away from the movement while we weaponize our privilege and attack people's languages if we wanna make it a battle of linguistics and semantics instead of acknowledging that people's lives are on the line. And it is very difficult to achieve accountability when people are fearful that if they tell the truth, that people are gonna jump down their throat for being honest. And in this way, it increases the harm rather than increases the healing because people are incentivized to lie. They're incentivized to deny. They're incentivized to, to hide if in such a, uh, punishing culture where telling the truth will get you punished. This also ends up gaslighting people. People have a reason for the beliefs that they have. And if you don't accept that other people's experiences lead to other beliefs, then you're gaslighting them. You're devaluing their lived experience. And in this way, you end up isolating people rather than uniting them. And most perniciously, it makes people feel more cynical and more hopeless as if nothing will ever get better when the human rights people who are supposed to be working for things to get better are so busily turning on each other, making everybody feel miserable, sucking all the joy out of doing human rights work because you permanently are walking around looking like a fight for, as a fight looking for a place to happen. And then it really does spiral out of control disproportionately in relationship to the original incident. So if someone uh, misgenders somebody, then next thing you know, you've got a whole conflagration over whether or not uh, the university is this or the, the, the class that took place in is this or did the professor or the other student do this and stuff. And so it doesn't match the threat assessment to the remedy. And then of course it assumes its own virality when it's done through social media. I think this is born out of the concept of toxic perfectionism, where we end up alienating people with our pursuit of political purity or political correctness by assuming that there's only one way to do things. And sometimes we become those saviors where we wanna take away someone else's pain by being their advocate. So we, we pounce and call out people uh, for quote, doing the wrong thing because we're again signaling how woke we are and we want to quote, help everybody. It's a good impulse to wanna help people but you don't wanna do uh, the right thing the wrong way. I think that it's, where easy, it's even more helpful to help people find and offer their own voices than representing them. And we have to stop walking around in fear that we'll be thrown under the bus if we say the wrong thing. And that's why transitioning to a calling in culture in my mind is so preferred. We need this culture shift. There also is a tendency to judge other people's activism while not judging one's own. I've said that 
We are unable to listen to people with their other viewpoints as if that's challenging our morality, our ability to do analysis, et cetera. So if you want to avoid toxic perfectionism leading to the call out culture, you've got to avoid these toxic online communities and really question why you're sabotaging your own happiness with all this unrestrained anger while the, the, the social media platforms are laughing all the way to the banks. Every time a call out on social media reaches 1 million views, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Instagram has made at least $400,000. So we're basically serving as the unpaid interns for the social media platforms when we indulge in these online communities that are so toxic. And you need to ask yourself, how is that working for you? How is, how is that helping your happiness? And are you really wanting to make the world cooler than it needs to be? And we've got to stop this performance of outrage because people are not perfect, like candidates aren't perfect. Uh, we've got to stop this expectation that the people we support, the people we work with, the people we love must be perfect while not recognizing our own imperfections. And we have a tendency to give breaks to friends, but not to other. Now, when you are called out, you feel very defensive, very shut down, feeling like you're getting mobbed and you're angry and isolated. You're hurt and unheard. You're dismissed. You Sometimes you turn around and attack others. A lot of people report feeling numb or going into denial. Of course, people want to deflect to other issues. It feels very personal as an ad hominem attack. Sometimes people counterattack or they get dismissive or they double down on the offense that they've done or they create a, a, a false equivalence of what about is, well, what about China if somebody says something about the US kind of thing or they break down into tears or they sabotage what is going on or they perform their outrage. Now, if someone calls you out, there's actually a three-step process that's very useful I believe for you to do. If someone calls you out, the first thing you should say is thank you. And this is a sincere thank you because they have gifted you with something that is very important, their time and their attention. And by saying thank you, you are appreciating and recognizing this gift without necessarily agreeing with the subject of the call out, but you are appreciating the time and the attention. The second step is to say, thank you, and I will consider what you said. With that second step, you acknowledge that you've heard them, but you don't necessarily agree with them, and you're saying that you'll consider what they said on your own timetable. You won't just immediately accept that they're right, but you are not denying that they might be right while you consider it. And the third step is to turn around and turn the calling out into a calling in because you can come back to the person and say, thank you, I will consider what you said. And by the way, are you okay? Is there something hurting you right now? Because I care about you as much as I care about myself. And I'm sure that something is going on with you because you came at me kind of aggressively and I'm sure that you could have gotten my attention another way outside of calling me out. So why don't we stop a minute and talk about what's going on with you as well so that your deeds are also bought into this situation. And so with those three steps, saying thank you, acknowledging that you've heard the person and three, showing concern for the other person is the best response I think of to being called in or out. Now, there's a reason why calling out is being criticized right now, because the whole right wing outrage machine <laughs> is reacting to this cancel culture, claiming that they are the victims of the cancel culture. But Tana Hesse Coates points out that any sober assessment of this history must conclude that the present objections to cancel culture are not so much concerned with the weapon as the kind of people who now seek to wield it. Until recently, cancellation flowed exclusively downward from the powerful to the powerless. But now in this era of falling gatekeepers, 
where anyone with a Twitter handle or Facebook account can be a publisher, banishment has been ostensibly democratized. And there are appropriate uses of fallout. Uh, when there are power disparities and people are inaccessible to you, you can use call outs. This is what the human rights movement does, but people need to understand that we in the human rights movement, we don't use the call outs as our first tactic, we use it as our tactic of last resort after we've tried other approaches that have failed to work. And we want to avoid increasing the harm through these other approaches, then we'll use the call out tactic. We can also build community and find others who are experiencing similar harm. And we do this by spreading information, often about those things that are causing harm that are hidden, unmarked, and they can be structures or privileges that cause a lot of harm, like institutional racism, for example. And often it is those voices that have been historically silenced that cause attention to those hidden or uh, unmarked privileges that we can use to call out to lift their voices up. And of course, calling out just really helps us release our, our anger, our pent up outrage. And there are unfortunately very few situations when public shaming works. I wanna give an example of a call out that really was a tragic situation. This is a picture of Alexi McCammon, who y'all may recall last summer was hired uh, as a 27-year-old Black editor of Teen Vogue. And then there were people who were dissatisfied with the process by which Alexi was hired, uh, who were on the staff of Teen Vogue. And one of them, an Asian-American staffer, decided to dig deeply into Alexi's background and unearth a 10-year-old tweet that Alexi had done when she was 17 that apparently was homophobic and racist. And so she weaponized this tweet uh, against Alexis and ended up getting Alexis fired. The irony was that the call out ended up biting her in the ass because someone else did the same thing to her. They did research on her older tweets, found out one that was 12 years old where she was both racist and inappropriate in a tweet. And so we've got to avoid this kind of gotcha culture. If you were going to deal with that situation that Alexi was in, we could have a calling in strategy by asking her some basic questions. What was going on with you at the time you wrote those tweets? And what feeling, what were you feeling then? Or what were you intending to convey? And by the way, what's going on with you now? Recognizing that there's a difference between what you said then and probably how you feel now. How do you feel about what you wrote? And do you believe an apology is necessary? And if yes, what can you do to repair the harm? And what is your plan for going forward? Just by asking questions when we think we've caught somebody in something they need to be held accountable for, we're acknowledging their humanity. The fact that they can, have, can be offered a chance to grow the same way someone else offered us a chance to grow. Instead of using these gotcha moments where you unearth mistakes from someone's past <clears throat> without seeking clarification, because we're all human beings who can make mistakes and we should be offered a chance to change and grow. And so calling in is learning through a growth mindset. Calling in is basically a call out done with love and, and particularly radical love, meaning you love people because of who you are, not who they are, to achieve accountability. And it requires giving each other the benefit of the doubt. Particularly in group settings, you've got to acknowledge that diverse people are on the same team and should and will have differences of opinion. Those differences of opinion may be the strength of that team because it allows all kinds of ideas to go into the, into the institutional pot so that you can really come up and emerge with the best thinking. It's always important to remember the broader context. For us to be pouncing on each other for relatively minor differences when we're dealing with the rise of neo-fascism and the destruction of democracy as we watch sounds a bit displaced to me. 
like we have no sense of proportion and no, or, or, or an inability to remember the broader context. Uh, one of the things we often say in academia is that we need more research and less me search, where people pay attention to things beyond their own noses. And it does require using active, loving, listening practices and being grateful for this shared opportunity to do better. So all calling in begins with self-assessment. You have to analyze how you feel and why you want to call somebody in. You really need to be in a healed enough space to have this conversation with someone else who may disagree with you. Because if you're not in a healed enough space, all you're going to do is bleed all over somebody else because you haven't called yourself in, you haven't prioritized yourself, you haven't even examined your own motives for why you want to call somebody in or out. And if you don't have good emotional management, your emotions like happiness can make you feel more creative and open, or your emotions like fear can make you feel more shut down. And so that's why that self-assessment is so important. It's also important to accept that you never will have the power to change others with some magic words. You can only offer love and respect. If human beings were given the power to change others, I mean, couples wouldn't fight, families wouldn't fight, classmates wouldn't fight, coworkers wouldn't fight. We don't have that magic power, but we do have the power to offer people grace, offer people respect, offer people love, and give them the opportunity to change themselves. And we can accept that we may still disagree, but that's all right, because people have the right to different opinions. I find that one of the greatest barriers to learning about the call-in culture is the lack of self-forgiveness. Because if you can't forgive yourself for your previous mistakes, then you're gonna find it extremely difficult to forgive others. And this may be tied to how mistakes were handled when you were a young person. Because when you were young, and if you made a mistake and you were severely punished for making that mistake and shamed for making that mistake, then you think it's quite normal to punish and shame others for their mistakes. But if you, if when you were young and you made a mistake and people, counseled you about that mistake, forgave you for it, taught you what you could learn from that mistake, then you're gonna be predisposed to offer that kind of grace and forgiveness to others. So here's some startup sentences for calling in. You know, a sample calling on sentence, like I said, is I beg your pardon. A sample calling in sentence. I'm not sure what you meant by that comment. Tell me more. You're, very few people can resist the invitation to tell you more about themselves. A sample calling out sentence could be, I can't believe you said that to me, as you say in all your outrage, or you said that period. And a calling it off sentence, I can't engage with this right now or ever. So if you want to interrupt the call out, you need to center yourself in your love practices so you can remain calm. You need to speak up through your discomfort, remind people of their human rights values and need for each other. You can check the emotional temperature of a room. Sometimes you need to recruit others to build joy and love and remind people that that's what we're trying to do. It may be necessary to redirect the conversation back to the agenda or have individual conversations with people who are called out or those who are calling others out and help people identify the problematic behaviors with specifics for changes. Very hard for people to make the changes you want if you can't tell them what you want and making a plan for future conversation. There are many different roles in the calling in process. There's the role of the survivor, the person who's been harmed, the person who's gonna advocate on the behalf of the person that's been harmed, the person who's going to intervene, trying to keep it from escalating, the healer who really wants to make sure that the person who's harming and the person who's being harmed both get what they need out of a given situation. There's the bridge builder who's trying to find common ground between the, the parties so that we can move forward. 
there's the bystander who very legitimately does not want to get involved in an emotional shit storm. So they want to stand out of it. And that's a very legitimate place to be because that's based on where they are in their emotional journey. Sometimes there's a witness or reflector who can account what actually happened and help people see through all the emotionality what the actual facts are of the case. Of course, there's a person who does the harm. The abuser, as I said, the bridge builder and the common ground builder can have very similar roles, but the common ground builder is not building uh, the common ground between the, 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 the conflicting parties so much as they're trying to help the whole group of the whole understand their common ground. There's a person who's going to constantly ask questions about what took place. Let's, let's, look, let's look at this in more depth, as well as working in close with the truth seeker who's trying to establish the reality of what took place. Uh, not only ask questions, but sometimes want to decline, declare what actually is taking place. So there's some sample ground rules for calling in. Don't hog all the airspace because other people process ideas differently and at their own pace. Understand that people are not angels or devils or good or bad, that these binaries are artificial. Calling in is not to be perverted as a license to act foolishly, abuse others, or be deliberately provocative. A lot of people mistakenly think that if, they, if we have a calling in ground rules or a calling in culture, that that just increases the stuff that they can get away with because no one will hold them accountable. And that is not true. It's not about civility, stifling debates or avoiding disagreements. We, but we do need to recognize that appropriate language is always shifting and is very group specific. So no language policing. Why would you wanna do that in the first place? Simply because you feel you know the latest lexicon that someone doesn't. And as has been often said, purity politics can make the perfect the enemy of the good. Sometimes you just want a solution that works even if it ain't the best or the perfect solution and that mistakes are learning opportunities in all experiments, so particularly in the human rights movement. We fail at much more than we achieve, but that doesn't mean we don't keep trying. I love this phrase from young people when they say, don't yuck my yum, because they want to acknowledge very appropriately that all ideas are welcome. And then we have to stop these status games where we attach appointment of importance to who says what, instead of focusing on what is said. And within the calling in uh, community and the culture we're trying to create, there's not gonna be any trigger warnings because this is a brave space, not a safe space. But we don't jump on people for having differences of opinion because it's not about disguising oppression with niceness so that difficult conversations are avoided or that victims survivor pain is minimized. It is the number one obligation of people who are harmed, people who are victimized to, to, to heal themselves, to prioritize themselves. It is not the job of the person being harmed or the person victimized to see about the healing or the growth of someone else. So let me end there. I wanna end with a quote from Grace Lee Boggs where she says, you cannot change society unless you take responsibility for it, unless you see yourself as belonging to it and responsible for changing it. So having said that, let me stop the share. <coughs> and get into the q and I'm sorry, my lectures can be very densely packed and so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Loretta. If, if everyone were able to unmute, which they're not, you would hear a, a resounding round of applause for, for your comments and your, and your overview. Um, um, I, I will be moderating the, the Q&A and um, a, a couple. Um, uh, I'll start with this one. Um, you talked about um, human rights victories. And I'm wondering what, what a couple of what human rights victories might look like for you? Um, well, first, let's talk about human rights. Most people only think of the tortured prisoner in a jail somewhere as a human rights 
issue. But in fact, uh, what Dr. King was referring to was that there are eight categories of human rights protections to which we are all entitled. There's civil rights, political rights, economic rights, social, in, uh, cultural, uh, environmental, developmental, sexual. And I think I got them all, I might've missed, missed one. But the point is, is that most of us are entitled to, all of us are entitled to human rights that we don't even know we have. And so a human rights victory would be the civil rights movement, fighting racial segregation, for example, even though we have not put an end to white supremacy, the victory that we achieved is not inconsequential because we live in a white supremacist society that finally more than half the white people are saying is not right. That has taken over 500 years to get to, but I'm not going to diminish its importance simply because it took so long for it to arrive kind of thing. Um, I was in the early anti-rape movement working at the first rape crisis center in the world. And when we started 50 years ago, because it was founded in 1972, we thought that we would end rape and sexual assault in a few years because we just knew we were right. And in fact, it has taken you know, five decades to get to the Me Too movement, so to speak. But we have certainly uh, made the whole world aware that violence against women is wrong. And so instead of, you know, there, there was a time when we started when people used to brag on the violence that they committed against women. Now they hide it because they know it's wrong. So that's a cultural shift that we've created. That's very important. And uh, we continue to work on ending not only violence against women, but violence against all people. Uh, the inclusion of LGBT folks, for example, in our discussions of violence is very, very important. I think a victory is the trans movement, the visibility, the things that have, that have been achieved that just a short while ago were unthinkable. I remember the fight to, to get, get trans people admitted to women's colleges and stuff like that. And so I see that as a victory. I mean, there's, there's so many, I can't count them all. And, and you really have to ignore mainstream media because mainstream media is, is so full of doom and gloom because they have a, if it bleed, it leads kind of philosophy. And so they're not as good as reporting on the improvements that we make as humanity as they are the disasters that we make as humanity. Uh, but I'm really encouraged by the fact that I've seen a lot of good victories in my lifetime. And I think I'll see even more. One of the, a wise elder once told me that I needed to chill, that I needed to kind of get over myself she said, Loretta, you're working as if you're the entire chain of freedom and you will burn out. She said, you're not the entire chain. The chain of freedom stretches back towards our ancestors or forward towards our descendants. The only thing you need to worry about is being the strongest link in the chain of freedom that you can be. And just focus on being that strong link so that the chain doesn't break at you, okay? <laughs> Well, stop trying to take responsibility for the entire movement and thinking that it's all going to rest on your shoulders kind of thing. And that was something that I needed to hear because I was approaching burnout. I was being a little too earnest. I didn't know how to toggle off my critical consciousness so that I can watch Twilight without doing a feminist analysis of it kind of thing. <laughs> I was sucking all the joy out of my own life and stuff. And so that's a victory for me, learning that we've, we've learned how to add self-care to political activism, which is something that my generation, because I'm almost 70 years old, we didn't get that memo. So I'm really pleased at how young people have infused the ethos of self-care into the movement as a victory. But it's going to take, you know, a long time. I think we get frustrated because we think we should be in charge of the timeline of change, but we're not. I will say one other thing in, in response. I've been too long, but I take a lot of hope 
out of the fact that the enemies of human rights mistakenly think that they're fighting the human rights movement. They think they're fighting us. And they couldn't be wrong, more wrong. We're fighting them, but they're not fighting us. They're fighting truth. They're fighting history. They're fighting time. And they're fighting evidence. And any one of those forces could kick their asses. You can't roll back time. You can't roll back the universe into the 19th century. You can't permanently deny the truth. You can't permanently bury the evidence of history, no matter how hard you try. And so I take a lot of comfort out of thinking that time, truth, evidence, and history are on our side. So even though it looks like our opponents have all the money, the power, and the mainstream media, and the propaganda, and the weapons of war, I think there's an inevitability about their defeat because they're up against forces no, no mankind can overcome. Well, the, the joy that you spoke of in, in the battle is evident in the way that you're talking and the glow in your face and... and um, Thank you for thank you for that perspective. Um, there are there are a lot of questions that have come in, so let's see. Um, I'm I'm going to start with this one. Um, thank you for this astoundingly helpful lecture. Are there some differences that are so hurtful that engagement and calling in is not worth the energy, like the KKK and other oppressors? Are there some non-negotiables that allow us to simply decry those who align with what we consider horrific? That's where the concept of self-assessment really matters. Because when I experienced hate crime violence when I was a child or sexual violence when I was a child, I was not in a space at that time to even contemplate calling in the people who frightened me, who tried to hurt me, who did hurt me, kind of thing, because I hadn't seen to my own healing. I had not recovered from the wound. I had not removed from them the power to hurt me. And so now, 50 years later, I do have that power I, of self-definition, of self-protection, so that I can call in somebody who'd been in the Ku Klux Klan. I learned how to deprogram them in the 1990s. Or I taught black feminist theory to men who had raped and murdered black women when I was in my 20s as part of my political process. And so no one can tell you when you're ready to do something about how you want to be in the struggle. That's why I really emphasize that no one, it should be voluntary. It should not be obligatory because your first priority has to be to take care of yourself before you even attempt to call somebody else in or out. I recommend taking care of self, but then there'll be others who are at other stages of their own journey, like me. I have no problem talking to people who violate others' human rights because I have removed from their, from their control the remote control to how I feel, <laughs> you know? And I have seen the humanity in the most undeserving people. And I like the way that I've grown to do that. But I don't expect everybody to be there or to go through what I've gone through to get there. We're all different and stuff. And so that's why I don't believe in competitive victimhood or competitive activism kind of thing. I try to say, you don't want to get into competitive victimhood with me because I've been through more stuff than you would like to even contemplate going through. <laughs> and, uh, and I can emerge from that, knowing who I am, still having the joy of life and still having the belief in humanity and stuff. And all I can do is offer you my example and my lived experiences uh, with, with the promise that things will get better if you work on your healing, develop your emotional intelligence and capacity for being self-critical, self-reflecting, and then learning how to offer uh, radical love to others. Mm -hmm. oh. 
Thank you. Um, uh, another another question, sh shifting gears a little bit. Um, you identified many different roles within a group that impact the work of calling in and calling out. Is it important to cultivate these different roles within team? Are there strategies that can support teams to invite members to take on these different roles? I think teams should be aware of the multiple, the, 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 the multiple roles that are available but who feels suited for each role will change over time. Some days I feel like being a witness. Some days I don't, I wanna be a bystander because I don't have the emotional bandwidth on that particular day. So there's no pre-assigning roles to people that are fixed so that they're always in that role, but it's something that a group can pre-plan. At the time you're coming together, you're, you, you can have a conversation. This is what we're going to do to establish a calling culture within our work. Who, you know, these are the possible roles people can occupy. Who's gravitating towards one versus the other based on how you feel? Okay, well, if nobody wants to be this, then we need, as a group, we can take responsibility for observing that we don't have somebody in that role. You know, who's going to be the person that makes sure that we stick to our own ground rules, for example? Who's going to be the person that says, if people get hurt, they want to make sure that they build a healing containers for the people that get hurt while the other, while, while, while other people deal with the person who did the hurting. I mean, there are all kinds of, of roles people can play, but don't assume that these are fixed roles because it all depends on where you are in that moment. Sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like engaging and sometimes I want to say, talk to the hands. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. and that's that's what self-determination is your right to state where you are in a given moment without apology and it, it given what you were describing earlier whatever your own self-assessment is about the kinds of roles you are even able to interested in capable of assuming to begin with i think starts with that self-assessment you were indicating before yeah, because if you're if it's you're fluid. still bleeding from microaggressions or somebody dead naming you or whatever, then you're not in a good place to try to work on how somebody else's growth. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because you need to work on your own healing mm -hmm. from that pain. And 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 it's very appropriate to ask for help in that healing process. Because so, you don't have to do it on your own, but that means that. You, are, you don't have to do the emotional labor of extending that radical love to others at the cost of extending it to yourself first. Mm -hmm. um, you, you spoke about working within a framework that you are trying to dismantle. Do you think that this is possible to do? I don't think we have a choice. We always we have to be radical revolutionaries and reformists at the same time. <laughs> I don't think we have a choice. And I think that binary is kind of artificial anyway. Uh, I find it a bit ironic that those of us of the most radical leftist persuasions are the ones who are defending democracy against those who used to say that they were the defenders of democracy but in fact, are anarchists trying to turn it down. Hmm. And uh, it, it, it's reminiscent of the way that the Democratic and the Republican Party switch roles after the Civil Rights Act bills were signed, you know, where the Republicans were the anti-segregationist movement and the Democrats, like the Democrats, were the pro-segregationists. And all it took was Lyndon Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act for the parties to switch positions so that the Republicans became the party of white grievance politics, anti-civil rights, and the Democrats became the pro-civil rights party. So, you know, right now I feel like the left and the right have switched positions again so that you find the left trying to defend conservative institutions like you know, the Supreme Court and universities <laughs> and, you know, the media and stuff like that. And you got the people 
on the right trying to tear all this stuff down, which a generation ago, they would have called themselves the defenders of America's institutions. And so it's, well, you know, Lily Tomlin has a saying that I can't help quote over and over again. And she says, no matter how cynical I become, I can't keep up. <laughs> the context may change. Exactly. <laughs> the cynicism can remain. Uh, okay, so there, there are questions coming in fast and furiously. So let's see here. Um, <clears throat> So it's very interesting. A lot of the questions are focused on sort of individual at, um, efforts at calling in um, versus more community level efforts at calling in and, and trying to make a distinction between um, what would it take to shift individuals attitudes um, and perspective versus here's one that says, what will it take to shift the online community from calling out and canceling so that real work and community can be built? Well, the online community is dependent on our voluntary participation in it. So it's like anything else. If you don't like what's happening with your engagement with the online community, uh, there's a thing called disengage. I mean, there's so much of life that's available, not online, that you have a choice about whether or not you want to participate in life outside of a keyboard kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I do find that it's even possible to create a calling in culture online uh, when we do our trainings. And by the way, we're having a uh, national conference call, a national Zoom call on March 28th, the week from today, on the topic of perfectionism and calling in and how that can help harm our movements. And so you can find out information on how to sign up for that on my website, LorettaJRoss.com. But you have choices about how you, how and to whom you give your attention. You're, you know, you're, it's not involuntary to, to do scroll, it's a choice. Uh, you, you can choose whether to disengage with TikTok or Instagram or something, seductive as they are. But a lot of things are seductive you have to resist. I mean, you know, it's seductive to drink too much, but you get to resist that. It's seductive to overeat, but you get to resist that. It's seductive to be mean to other people when you've got a sharp mind, but you have to resist that kind of stuff. Um, I, I find that there's some people who just so love to indulge in sarcasm, they don't know when to turn it off because they take advantage of their quick wits against everybody else, but they have to resist that. So you get to choose how you want to control social media or be controlled by social media. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really the fact that they want to control you still doesn't relieve you of the responsibility of resisting the control. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, um, I think these, these next couple of questions might align. One, one was interested in a personal success or a time you saw change happen. And one is a little bit more specific. Can you talk about the evolution of the term women of color at the National Women's Conference perhaps as one of your first calling in experiences. Okay. So the first one was about when have I seen change happen? A personal success. Mm -hmm. Oh, personal success. Oh, well, it starts with a personal failure. When I was 27, I was uh, drug addicted. And yet I was the director of the Rape Crisis Center, but I was self-medicating because I hadn't uh, gotten any help for the turmoil that was functioning as my brain. And I got into a lot of trouble trying to ignore how messed up I was inside and trying to cover that up with the political work that I was doing. 
And the trouble I got in is that I embezzled some money from the Rape Crisis Center, my organization, which is to, to, to pay for my drug habit, <laughs> literally to pay for my drug habit. Thinking in, you know, like most drug addicts do, oh, I'll pay them back, uh, it'll be okay, right? Well, I got fired for doing that. Obviously. Well, actually I was asked to resign for doing that, obviously. But the reason it turned into my greatest triumph instead of my greatest tragedy, even though it ended up in the Washington Post. So at the time I thought it was the worst thing that could have happened to me because I was publicly shamed for having done it. But the, right, the reason it turned into my greatest triumph is that those older black women on the board of the Rape Crisis Center, while they fired me, they didn't give up on me. They called me in, you know? They kept working with me. They're the ones that told me to go get some therapy, which I did for what was going on. 10 years later, one of them recommended me for a job, uh, wrote me a glowing letter of reference because of what potential she saw in me despite the very public and visible mistake that I made. Um, some of them are my friends even to this day, you know, 40 years later. And so that probably meets my definition of a personal triumph coming out of a personal tragedy kind of thing. Now, the term women of color <clears throat> was created in 1977, and I was not there. I, but I can report on what happened because I was good friends with the older Black women who were there. And they came back from Houston, the Houston Women's Conference in 1977, and told me what happened. Uh, President Jimmy Carter had given $5 million to what's called the women's movement to have a national conference for women in Houston in 1977. And this was part of the world decade for women that had been declared by the United Nations in 1976. And so the women's movement in the US thought that we needed to have a US conference and the purpose of the US conference was to put together a national plan of action for women in the United States to go along with the global or the world plan of action that was being developed at the UN level. And so the conference was held in Houston. I think it was November of 1977. In the draft document of the draft plan of action, uh, there were two pages out of, I think, about 200 that were written about minority women, what minority women needed in this plan of action. And a group of Black women in Washington, D.C. were dissatisfied with that because they thought that it needed to be much more expansive, much more inclusive, and much more detailed. So they formed a group called the Black Women's Agenda. And these are people from uh, the National Council of Negro Women, Delta, the, the sororities, the service agencies and stuff like that. Well, black women that have formed a Black Women's Agenda. And so they put together and wrote something called the Black Women's Agenda and they took it to Houston with the intent of getting the body of Houston to uh, vote on, approve, ratify this as a substitute, plan, a substitute for the two pages in the plan of action. They wanted the Black Women's Agenda to be substituted into the National Plan of Action. Hope I'm making sense here. But when they got to Houston, a strange thing happened. Other minority women wanted to be included in the Black Women's Agenda. Well, if they did that, then it wasn't just a Black Women's Agenda. And so it was in those negotiations that the term women of color was created so that they can include Latinas and Asian American and indigenous women in the black women's agenda. And the term women of color became a term of political solidarity, not biological designation, because your, bio, you know, your biological designation within the social constructs that we're dealing with, because it's all made up but still, uh, your biological designation of Asian American or you know, Afro-Caribbean or, you know, indigenous, they are what they are. The point of the term women of color is an expression of who you're going to work in solidarity with who are also oppressed by not being white kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so 
when the uh, term women of color was created in Houston uh, and attached to the document and put to the vote, well, it was helped by the fact that Coretta Scott King read the resolution <laughs> calling for it to be voted upon. Uh, Gloria Steinem told me that. I didn't know that detail because I wasn't there. So Gloria gave me that detail that the whole thing was read orchestrated by Coretta. I was like, oh, Coretta, I didn't know that about you. Anyway, so it got overwhelmingly approved as the substitute. The Women of Color agenda was approved to go into the U.S. Plan of Action. And that's where the term women of color came from as a statement of solidarity, not, not, not ethnic identity. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, since then, people only see it as ethnic identity, not state, not political solidarity. I see. I, I think the, the question writer was wondering if that was an example of a, a, a calling in experience. But I, I hear, yeah. I think it was because the Black women could have very easily said, no, y'all do your own agenda. We did our, we did our work. Y'all go off and do your own kind of thing. Yeah. And instead, and 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 uh, and the other women could have called them out for quote omitting them, kind of thing. But instead, they figured out how to work in solidarity together, and mm -hmm. stuff, and and transform the movement. And unfortunately, a lot of people when they hear the term women of color, they think because they've heard it from white people, they assume that white people created it and affixed it to people of color. They don't see it as a term of self-definition and self-determination. And so that's why they push back on it. I'm not a person of color. I am indigenous. I am this. I, and Scott, they really get confused on what the term works to do. So we are, um, we're at 117 and I know we, we were supposed to end at 115. So um, I, I know that you mentioned a couple of um, the March 28th, there's something coming up that you- um... uh, Our national calling in conversation on perfectionism. And people who are interested in learning more about the calling in techniques and approaches that you've outlined here today. Look at my website. Look at your uh, website. Uh, starting in the, probably in May or June, uh, we offer $5 classes on learning calling in techniques. And so we're gonna probably go back to our public classes. As soon as I get past this semester, I will go back to the online classes. I started the online classes cause of COVID and, and it's been hard to do both online and in-person stuff all at the same time. So I wanna get through this semester and then I'll get back to the online classes starting in the summer. So I, there are a lot of people in the audience who can relate to the um, challenge between moving online and in-person. And we're so grateful that this online venue allowed us to have you with us for um, unfortunately too short a time. There are so many expressions of appreciation and thanks um, in, in the Q&A that I can see. Um, thank you for your honesty and sharing, sharing your personal triumph story, sharing your wisdom. Um, and I, I, um, the, the ideas of radical love and um, in, in, in the fight for human rights is I think something that is um, an important message for all of us to take, to take forward um, and, and an opportunity and an invitation for all of us to, um, to work on our own capacities and our own abilities. And we know the resources that you provide for us to, to move forward in this, um, in this quest for larger human rights, which you so beautifully outlined for us. So thank you so much. Thank you. I look forward to it. And if you can send me a copy of the recording and the Q&A so I can see it, I'd love that. Oh, I would I'd love appreciate to that. happily do that. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye y'all. Bye.